Yeah, my name is Dustin Hyros, and I'm with HDR Engineering here in Missoula, Montana, and I lead our bridge group here in Montana. And this presentation is on the Capital Cedar Interchange Project. Uh, this is a steel bridge project that was completed a while ago now, uh, back in 2017, but was a pretty significant project um, that provides a really good model uh, of how we delivered a, a complex project in Montana. Um, so there, there were quite a few uh, folks and stakeholders that helped make this project a success. Uh, I do want to specifically acknowledge Stephanie Brandenberger. Uh, she's the state bridge engineer at MDT. Uh, we gave a similar presentation a few years ago, and she helped put together uh, some of the material for the presentation that I'll be talking about today and was certainly instrumental uh, to the success of the project. So the, the kind of the theme behind the presentation is that front end planning reduces risk during construction. Um, and I realize that sounds pretty obvious, but a lot of times, uh, especially prior to this project, uh, we addressed risk during construction, rather during the design phase. And we have a tendency of kind of putting that all on the contractor. And the more complex a project is, uh, the more advantageous it is to mitigate risk up front during the design phase. And this particular project is a great example of how those risks, those construction risks were identified during the design phase and through a lot of problem solving with multiple stakeholders, uh, primarily MDT and the railroad, uh, better set the stage for the contractor to complete the work during construction. So just a little bit of background on the project. Uh, it's located in Helena, Montana. It's on Interstate 15 and it begins at the Capitol Interchange and then extends northward uh, up to the Cedar Street interchange. And there's about a mile between the interchanges with some, some pretty steep grades on the interstate uh, in order to get up and over the railroad tracks. Uh, this section of highway has pretty high traffic volumes. Uh, during construction, there was about 25,000 ADT um, and a lot of weaving movements uh, between the interchange interchanges. This is actually uh, just one of a few grade separated crossings uh, over the tracks in Helena so it's heavily used by local commuters in addition to the, the relatively high volumes of through traffic. Um, the existing bridge crosses over Montana Rail Link's uh, main rail yard that has 14 tracks and it also spans over a local city street called Boulder Avenue. Um, the purpose of the project was primarily to increase capacity, uh, provide three lanes in each direction, obviously improve safety, uh, and then the focal point was to replace the functionally obsolete and seismically deficient bridges. And so although the, folk, or the project was focused on replacing the bridges, there were a lot of challenges that were really attached to that objective. Um, and the first was the rail yard. Uh, this is a very busy rail yard. Again, there's 14 active tracks. Uh, so the railroad was a key stakeholder, Montana Rail Link was. Uh, maintenance of traffic, uh, there's, as I said before, high traffic volumes, not only through traffic, uh, but there was also weaving movements between the interchanges. Um, you can't really detour I-15, right? So we had to maintain traffic on this route while we build bridges. So maintenance of traffic was a key criterion. And then there's winter in Montana, of course. We have a pretty short construction season. There's only about seven months um, to complete the work uh, prior to winter shutdown. And we really needed to build one of the bridges in the first uh, construction season uh, so that that would allow us to open the interstate up fully again uh, during that winter shutdown period. And there was a whole slew of other challenges. Um, again, this, this was in the city of Helena, so we had the local uh, city of Helena as a stakeholder. Uh, we had noise impacts. We actually had a couple of noise walls that were added to the project pretty late during project development. Uh, drainage design was, was tricky. Uh, we had a lot of retaining walls due to kind of the, well, the compressed right of way through that corridor. Uh, we had lead contaminated soil in the rail yard that we had to handle and mitigate uh, during construction. Uh, there were some seismic and geotechnical challenges. Uh, cost was a big one. Um, at the time, this was one of the bigger, bigger projects for MDT. Uh, and then the last one there, just being in the state capital, 
you know, this route is used a lot to get over the tracks. In fact, MDT headquarters is just right off of Capital Interchange. You could actually see the, the project site from headquarters. Um, so there was just a lot of visibility on the project. Uh, so it really needed to go successfully. So how do we determine the right bridge type? Well, although it was a bridge project, uh, there were many other factors that I just mentioned that we needed to consider. Um, so this required uh, a very comprehensive evaluation of risk, uh, construction methods, a sequencing with respect to each bridge type to determine, you know, what would be the overall best project option, not just really, not just what the best, best bridge alternative is. Um, so we developed some evaluation criteria. Obviously, railroad impacts was a big one. Uh, impacts to roadway geometrics. Uh, again, these interchanges were closely spaced, and so a bridge alternate that impacted the roadway profile grade or alignment could potentially impact the interchanges, and there's obviously some pretty major cost and schedule implications with that. Uh, constructability is always a concern, along with that construction duration. Uh, life cycle cost and maintenance, uh, and then of course initial project cost, uh, those were all kind of important criteria in determining what the right bridge type would be. So in the beginning, uh, we, we had looked at just about every possible bridge type that you could think of. We had 23 different alternates on the table uh, during that initial phase, uh, and then we were able to narrow that down to a more probable group of six options uh, in phase two that, that we looked at in a lot more detail. Um, there were uh, long span options and short span options, of course. Uh, railroad impacts were an important driver for determining the best bridge type. Uh, you know, and at first it, it might seem like the best option is to see if we can completely span over the rail yard or at least, you know, limit the number of piers within the yard. Um, but although those long span options uh, like, like steel trusses or even concrete segmental, uh, some deep plate girder options, you know, had the benefit of, of limiting uh, the footprint in the yard, there were a lot of greater impacts elsewhere, in particular geometric impacts uh, that would require a raise in, in roadway grade uh, that could potentially uh, extend back to the interchanges. So in the end, more, more conventional span arrangements uh, ended up prevailing. And actually, there were two of them. Uh, one was a uh, pre-stressed, post-tensioned splice concrete eye girder. And then the other one was a welded steel plate girder. Um, and MDT actually elected to advance both of these options into final design just to allow for some flexibility uh, for the contractor uh, and provide for some competitive bidding. Now, both those alternates had the exact same span configuration, location of piers, uh, so it allowed them to easily integrate into other disciplines and into the overall bid package. And at the end, the uh, selected bridge alternate was a steel alternate. Um, that bridge is about 800 feet long uh, with a total of four spans. On the screen here, you can see the completed uh, northbound bridge. And, and you might recognize that, you know, this design looks very conventional. I mean, the spans are symmetrical, balanced, uh, very cost effective. And, you know, there were certainly challenges with the design. You know, it, it was not a no brainer. There were certainly some complexities. Um, but with respect to a plate girder bridge, this is, this is pretty conventional. So really what made this project unique uh, was all the upfront planning and coordination that allowed this particular bridge alternate to be built. Um, in fact, it's important to note that um, this alternate required that we relocate three railroad tracks in order to accommodate this particular span configuration. Uh, it was actually more cost effective to move the tracks than it was to lengthen the spans, which um, this provides a pretty good segue into the next slide, which is a risk management. And so there were many investments um, that uh, occurred during the design phase in order to reduce risk. Um, and there's a few of them that I'm going to hit on for the purpose of this presentation. And the first one is railroad coordination. Uh, Montana Rail Link was a key stakeholder. Uh, so we needed to develop a partnership with them from the beginning. And in fact, we brought them on board at the very initial phases when we were just brainstorming bridge alternatives. Uh, it was very important to understand railroad operations, uh, what tracks carry the most train traffic, uh, what were future plans for expansion within the yard, 
and what were the critical needs in order to keep the rail yard uh, up and operating. And then ultimately during the construction, you know, determine what those requirements would be, uh, such as what are acceptable work windows, allowable track closures, uh, access points to the yards, uh, how materials and equipment could be staged within the yard, and essentially determine those requirements that allow for the least impact to the railroad operations, but yet at the same time weren't so restrictive that we couldn't practically build the bridge within that aggressive schedule. Um, so that early coordination with the railroad ultimately resulted in uh, significantly reduced risk for the contractor and really all parties for that matter uh, by predetermining those construction requirements during the design phase. So bridge foundations uh, were a very critical element and a high risk element. Um, the design had to consider how we maintain clearances from active tracks you know, what those limited work windows, I mean, we only had so much time to build the, build the foundation, so the work windows were important. Uh, and the need for temporary shoring uh, to support the tracks during the foundation construction. Uh, and this photo on the bottom of the, the screen really does a good job of showing just how disruptive that foundation construct, construction can be uh, to rail yard operations. Um, so we started with some very early geotechnical sampling and engineering recommendations just to try and predict with some reasonable confidence how large those foundations would be for a particular bridge alternate. Uh, this helped establish the needed footprint for the bridge foundations uh, and what that possible impact to the rail yard would be with respect to each of the alternates being considered. Uh, in addition to that, this site offered some challenging soil conditions uh, and then it had a, a relatively shallow stratum of dense boulders and gravel that were only about 25 or 30 feet below the surface. And driven piles were the preferred foundation type, uh, but there was some concern that the piles would refuse uh, at the top of that layer before they had enough lateral resistance uh, to withstand seismic loads. So during the design phase, we actually uh, worked with MDT to launch a pile test program where we installed uh, piles and then and tested them for not only axial capacity, but we did a lateral load test and an uplift load test just to make sure we could achieve that needed capacity during construction. Um, that test program, I believe, ended up costing about $200,000, but ended up saving about uh, $3 million in construction cost. And the last item I wanted to hit on was construction sequencing um, and estimating. Uh, remember that the a driving criterion for the project was to be able to build one of the bridges in that first construction season. Um, this would allow the interstate to be open fully during the winter shutdown period. Um, we did not want single lane head-to-head -head traffic uh, maneuvering through the crossovers and weaving between the interchanges through those icy winter months. So it was imperative uh, that we could get that first bridge built in that first season. So HDR has a group of construction schedulers and estimators that we brought on board uh, to perform a very detailed constructability review uh, to help determine construction durations and help verify that we could actually build one of these bridges in a single season. And at the same time, that helped identify some of those construction risks or schedule risks that could be mitigated during the design. Uh, and the foundation construction happened to be one of those. Additionally, the project cost was important um, since this particular project would, at the time, use a pretty good portion of MDT's funding. So um, we wanted to have a good handle on what the construction cost would be, um, how much and or if additional crews and equipment would be needed to complete that work within the aggressive schedule. So we basically utilized that same team of construction engineers to develop a production-based estimate um, from a contractor's viewpoint just to better determine project cost, uh, considering some of those elevated challenges and risks. So when it was all said and done, the project, the total project cost was right around $32 million. Um, when we actually began the project, those are initial estimates for right around $50 million. Um, so that upfront planning and investment and risk mitigation during the design really helped kind of bring that cost down. Um, the total steel quantity was about 2000 tons. And then the bid price to reckon in place was, was very low, $1.10 per pound. So um, that's about as low, I think, as I've ever seen it. Um, so just to conclude, uh, construction was successfully completed on schedule. 
which demonstrates how early investments in, in to manage risk really provide high value to a project like this one. And with that, I will conclude.